tried to stay, but all in vain. The price we pay, and nothing to gain. Every time we meet, I can't let go. Hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm Ben from Universal Audio, and welcome to yet another Monday. We're back with Office Hours. Uh, We had a lot of fun last week uh, hanging out with the Black Pumas. Uh, I know a bunch of you guys got to tune in for that, but if you haven't seen it yet, stop. Just, you know what? Who cares about MIDI? This is going to be on forever. You should go check out our show last week with the Black Pumas featuring the UAFX pedals. Uh, I've actually already rewatched it myself twice, and I hate watching myself on camera. But I've, I've watched that show twice because I love their music that much, and it was so cool seeing it stripped down and uh, kind of transformed with just the three of them performing. Uh, but yeah, guys, it's yet another week. This week, uh, we've got a, a great show for you. We're going to be talking about some of the advanced MIDI techniques inside of Luna, and then we're going to do a deep dive into Capital Chambers plug-in here at the end. Uh, and since, as you guys probably noticed, it's, uh, it's kind of summertime here in, in the States, which means people are taking vacations. So I'm joined today by Matt Peterson. Matt, it's just you and me, dude. Just you and me. Yeah, we don't, Drew's out. We don't. We don't need Drew. We don't need Connor. We don't need Monty. We just. It's just the two of us. We're gonna. It's us and and of course everybody hanging out here in the chat with us. Yeah, just the we, MIDI boys. Just the MIDI boys and the lunatics. <laughs> uh, 
man, but this is gonna it's gonna be a fun show. Uh, you know, MIDI. Something I feel like I see a lot of people saying like, man, I'm I'll, I'll, I'm waiting to get into Luna until like the MIDI gets there, and I'm like I'm always kind of curious like what people think when the MIDI gets there because like there's base almost everything I want to do in MIDI Luna does right now. Um, so I think it's gonna be kind of fun today. I think we're gonna highlight some of the advanced MIDI topics that maybe people didn't already know about uh, yeah. because when you think about the MIDI basics. Uh, there happens to be a pair of amazing tutorials that succinctly wrap up how to do all the basics around MIDI, um, which uh, I feel like, oh, uh, who did the, who, I recognize the voice from somewhere, but where, where did that <laughs> voice come from? <laughs> it's yep, it's Matt, by me. the way, yeah, guys. Uh, yeah, it's Matt. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I was pulling up the links in the background so I can share them with the chat here, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Post so, them right here. Yeah, so we'll post the links in the chat. If you guys haven't already checked out these basics and you, you, you know, you're running into any any walls when it comes to MIDI, uh, definitely start there with those two. But then we're gonna kind of we're gonna assume the knowledge base is above where those videos are. We're gonna kind of continue taking them forward from there. But uh, we'd also love to hear from you guys in the chat uh, what some of the some of the some of the things about MIDI that you guys want to know. You know, can Luna do? And I've already, I've already seen one in here kind of asking about multi-channel. All right. Yep. Noted. It doesn't do multi-channel yet, but keep on, keep on hitting the feedback button, letting the team know how important multi-output uh, instruments are for you guys uh, and for your workflow. Um, but also uh, freeze and commit. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a good one, Spencer. Um, and and Tom hasn't been on in a while either. Yes, uh, t hit the feedback button for more Tom. <laughs> Uh, Tom's, as you guys maybe know or could recognize from uh, from Tom's accent, Tom is uh, he's in the UK, when uh, he's also he's technically got a he has a job at UA where he has to uh, <laughs> he's got to do sales and uh, and stuff with the dealers and all the influencers over in the UK. So he's not able to join us for very many office hours these days, as I'm sure yeah. you guys have noticed. Um, yeah, he's probably somewhere having a beer right now, not working. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> as he should. Nice, um, awesome guys. What added drum editor view, David? I got we got a tip that I think you'll you'll really like for that one. And yeah, yeah you we guys, got something for you. Commit and freeze. Yep, keep definitely hit the feedback <laughs> on those. I I think multi output commit and freeze are some of the big ones that uh that folks are really looking forward to um, as as future features. But I think a lot of these other ones we're gonna kind of we're gonna actually gonna be able to touch on here today. Uh, before we dive in, just real quick, uh, I noticed a lot of you guys were enjoying the countdown music as we're Matt and I were over here being like, "Damn, I, li I like this one." Uh, yeah, which, there's some good ones in there. Some good ones in there. Uh, Surprise! It seems like a weekly occurrence, though, uh, and that's because you guys keep on sending us music to feature during the during the countdown. So if you've got a project that you worked on, uh, if UA, you know, Apollo or UAD or Luna, if, if it was at all a part of it, and and you'd like to share it with the world. Uh, hit us up live at uaudio.com is the email address. Uh, shoot us an MP3 and a little description about the song, and uh, we'll feature it in our countdowns. And of course, for the pictures, it's as easy as hashtag Universal Audio on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, and we find those images and put them there into the countdown. Um, so it's really easy to be a part of the show in that sense. And uh, the uh, yeah no no noticing the color choice with the command click it turns out what we thought was a tip was a bug <laughs> that was not meant to be in there so the, the as soon as the the devs were apparently the devs also watch office hours uh, because they came back being like oh, what they uh, so yeah it is at a, as of one dot one dot nine is no longer in Luna uh, but if you do want more color palette features you guys know what to do hit the feedback button let the team know uh, that you would like a refined color picker. Uh, to be added to uh, back into Luna, and they'll they'll hear you guys on that one. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely be sitting in that one. <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly. I do, I, I, as I mentioned on the show, I, I love I like how my drums kind of like a, a dark brown or, or burgundy, you know, like a kind of a, a very rustic, earthy color. I just um, go all black, everything, and mix on hard mode. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> just turn your eyes off. No waveforms allowed. Yep. <laughs> Nice. Uh, Metrop uh, Metropolis is asking for special features and shape. Yeah, we can. Uh, I don't think we have any super uh, shape focused stuff in here, but uh, I'll pull it up because I've got some stuff in my example of shape and I can show you a few uh, sp few special tips in there. 
speaking of Tom, we did a whole shape deep di- deep dive last year. Uh, so yeah. you know, uh, Metropolis, if you got some if you got some time, definitely go back and uh, search our YouTube channel for Shape, and you'll see there's a, a nice long deep dive show that we did with Tom, where literally we covered just about every aspect of Shape in that one episode, along with some incredible examples. Yeah, Tom um, whipped up some great songs for that one. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh great guys. So we're we're gonna I'm gonna jump in here and uh kinda talk about some some MIDI workflow things and we're gonna I'm gonna go by judge of hands here. How many people already knew about these uh these first I guess these first three tips and this is uh kind of a, these are kind of workflow based things um that mainly apply to MIDI, but a few of these techniques also will apply to uh to working with audio. And the number one thing that i do all the time because like you know looking at this right now right i can see i can see my notes you know i don't have that many tracks in the session you know as it gets fuller and fuller you know say i spend a lot of time looking at my edit window and it looks like this right really small tracks small lanes but then i'm like cool i i want to check out like what's going on with the with my midi instruments here so you know of course i can come in here i can do control up arrow and kind of expand those tracks uh, but that's that's a lot of clicks. It's a lot of extra effort. Um, and if you already if if you guys have been watching for a while, you probably know the the key command I'm about to say again because it's one of my favorite ones. I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you a chance to shout it out in the chat first. But all right, too late. It's the E key. <laughs> so whenever you hit the E key, whatever you have selected, whoosh, zooms right into that. So by hitting you know by kind of selecting the area that I'm interested in, you know, it could just be one track. Say I just want to check out my bass. Uh, my bass track, you know, from here to here, select that area, hit the E key, and you see it. Luna automatically kind of brings that area into focus. Um, so personally, what I like to do is just kind of like select an area that I think it's around. You know, I'm not super precise about this, and then hit the E key. And there we go. Now, now it pulls everything up. Um, so this is a really quick, easy way to get into a notes editor. Um, and of course, you know, if you just select a clip, like here, I just selected the clip of my of my bass. I hit the E key twice, once to get out of the focus, and then another time to get back into my new selection uh, for that focus. And again, hit the E key to get out of there. Um, so this is this is kind of my number one navigation tip for if you're doing MIDI note editing, uh, audio editing, doesn't matter what it is. Select an area, hit the E key. And if you don't already know, now you know. Uh, so that's one. Another one uh, I've seen come up a couple times. Again, this it really helps when you guys have got larger sessions. Um, so, you know, my example here is a is a medium sized session, not a uh, not a large boy. Uh, but something that hopefully you guys know about, and we've talked about it a couple times here on the show, I think, is a thing called alternate windows, or you know, making a new alternate window, uh, which I think yeah, I've already got an alternate window set up here. Um, so let me just I'll close that so you guys can see this ha- happen in action. So come up here, new alternate window. The shortcut for it is command option equals. And the w- thing I really like about how Luna handles alternate windows is you can really customize each window to do exactly what you want. So right now I just kind of made them duplicates of each other, but on my alternate window, which by the way, the easiest way to tell which window you're in, your main window will always have this UA diamond up in the top left whereas your alternate window will not. So that's that's a good way to keep track. And of course your alternate window has got an X button so you can always get yeah. you can always close it out. Um, but what you can do here is I can say I say I wanted a, a window dedicated to just my MIDI instruments. What I can do is I can just hide all of my instrument tracks from this view. And now, you know, now I can maximize the, maximize my regions here. Now I've got a, a dedicated MIDI window, and then I've got you know kind of my overall arrangement. Um, and the other thing I like about how Luna does this is it's not just one or two windows. I can hit Command Shift equals again, and it pops open a third window. It can pop open a fourth window. Like you can, <laughs> I'm not sure if there's a limit to how many of these. I think your computer will probably start blowing up around uh, you know four or five, yeah. uh, <laughs> depending on your machine. But you can set up multiple multiple things. You can set them side by side. No, what I also really like is that it's not just the tracks that you can show and hide, but you can come in here and I can say, you know what, man, I don't need, I don't need anything but the timeline. Kind of make some more horizontal space available to you uh, by coming up here to the view in the toolbar, and you can turn turn different aspects of the GUI on and off up there, uh, which is is really really cool. 
Um, so yeah, alternate windows, hiding meters, making a, a MIDI focused area. You can make this, you know, you could even go down to just a single track or two on here if you really wanted to focus and have, say like, this could be my drums and bass window that only shows these two tracks, um, yeah. something like that. If you're coming from a DAW that has like a dedicated MIDI editor window, this is like a really good workaround. This really helped me get comfortable with the, the way that Luna handles MIDI when I was first kind of transferring over. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can just kind of keep it off to one side, hit E, and then you have like a, a dedicated MIDI editor window that you can still glance at your main window to see your full thing in context. So yeah, yeah. this is super useful for, uh, especially if you're just getting used to the way Luna handles MIDI. Hell yeah. Nice. Uh, and then, you know, I saw your question earlier about, you know, being able to do a dedicated, uh, you know, drum editing. Um, so the, the tip here, man, this is so kind of a really cool feature. You can already see, uh, let me zoom this track out. So, you know, by default, say you're normally used to seeing, uh, used to seeing your MIDI notes, you know, kind of like this and say you had a, a percussion or a drum thing going on. Uh, you've got lots of extra notes that you're not using. Um, so what's, what's really kind of rad about this is that you can do uh, the fit and the fold buttons. So at the top and at the bottom of the keyboard area here. Uh, so with this track, when I hit the fold, uh, fold button, what it's going to do is it's just going to so show C, sharp, C and C sharp, my kick and snare on those tracks. So if you've kind of played something in, if you've, you know, if you've kind of figured out what drum sounds you're going to use, if you hit the if you hit the fold button, it just automatically it just shows you those lanes and it makes going back in and doing drum editing uh, or programming for that matter uh, that much easier. Uh, and Matt actually hit me with a really cool tip um, about this uh, for kind of a quote unquote scale mode is that you can go in and record record your scale right. So uh, if you make let's say uh, let me show highlight my bass track here. Just got a little, a few more notes to it, but you can notice like there's there's notes in here that are obviously outside the scale that I'm not, I'm never gonna play. Uh, so again, I can just do this, hit fold, and now I'm just I'm just seeing the notes that I have played. Uh, and of course, you can see it makes it really apparent where uh, notes that aren't don't belong are, are jumping in here because you see them uh, highlighted. Uh, but this is a great way to yeah, if you kind of record the scale that you're working in. Hit the fold button, and then now you can. If you're a bit more of a click and kind of program that way, uh, now my my MIDI view is just showing me the notes uh, that are inside the scale that I'm playing. Um, so I really really like that feature. And then the other one, uh, so that's that's fold at the top. The fit all it what it does is it zooms your notes to maximize uh, to the maximum height that they can to all fit in there. Uh, so, you know, if you're, if you're constantly looking at your MIDI notes and they're, they're zoomed like this, of course, if, if you're hitting the E key, the E key seems to, it does the fit while it does the expansion at the same time. Um, but if you're zooming the traditional way, then you can always hit the fit button. Now I'm seeing all the notes, so you can still see it's chromatic over here. Uh, but now it's maximized, uh, to my, to my window. Um, so those are, those are a couple of really handy and i love that fold by the way it holds and you can see like hey this track is folded up i'm just seeing my kick and snare uh information there and you can see these ones too like the fit button is hit on them if i turn the fit off now we're, you know my bass track is transformed into a very skinny line that's hard to decipher but if i hit the fit button now it's kind of expanded so i can see the notes in, inside my clip that much easier yeah, especially if you're trying to line up audio with like some MIDI or vice versa, that makes it super useful to actually see where the MIDI notes in or where the, where the MIDI notes are rather, and then you can zoom in and kind of place your audio right mm -hmm. there. Yeah, because uh, if you guys are like me, MIDI is half about getting the stuff in there and then half about fixing it up after you've gotten like yeah, you know, ninety percent that's close enough, and then and then the editing takes over. Yeah. Um, Nice. Right, so those are a couple of quick, easy workflow tips. I'm going to throw it to, uh, to Matt to kind of let's talk about a little bit about MIDI CCs, which are the other, like, if we're talking about advanced MIDI editing, like, CCs are, are really a huge part of that. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, if you've um, kind of played around with MIDI instruments inside of Luna before, you probably noticed that there, right now there's you can't, like, map uh, parameters to your MIDI controller super easily. Like, for example, you want to cut control the cutoff of like the mini moog or something like that mm -hmm. uh, but they're actually you can do it with cc's which is makes it a super powerful way to kind of control certain parameters while you're playing and while you're performing um so yeah for, for mini moog for example 
let's say um, I wanted to control the cutoff frequency, you know, while I'm playing. Um, if you go to help.uiu.com, just search for the mini Moog. There's this article, which is all about, it's pretty much the manual for the mini Moog. Um, and towards the very bottom here, there's this table that shows you all the MIDI CC numbers. Um, so for example, 74 is the filter cutoff frequency. Um, so just using that as an example, I have a um, MIDI controller in front of me here, and one of my knobs is mapped to MIDI CC 74. So you can see when I move it, it's moving the cutoff frequency here. Nice. And what's cool too is 74 is kind of the universal standard for cutoffs. Uh, right. So I've done this like with my sub fatty in the back. Like the sub fatty automatically had the cutoff knob on 74. So it was an instant kind of grab and go uh, one to one relationship there, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to kind of control the cutoff while you're playing, um, you do the MIDI CC. If you want to do it after the fact, you can, of course, use an automation lane just like you would for any other parameter. Um, but for example. Yeah, now I can actually do. Oh, much have latch on. One second here. Now I can actually do like expressive, you know, uh, cutoff filter sweeps while I'm recording. And then, of course, I can go in and edit them after the fact. Um, so let me just record a quick little sweep here. And you can see what that looks like. Cool. So I'm going to hit the E key, use Ben's little trick. Um, <clears throat> and right now I can't see the. Uh, modulation that I just recorded. So the first thing you want to do is hit the little velocity stock icon right here that'll open the velocity lane, um, which is also where all the mini CCs are seen and edited. Um, so I'm going to click on velocity here. Since I know that um, it's CC 74 for the cutoff, I'm just going to type in 74 up here. It's going to bring it up. Um, it's called brightness because that's actually what it's labeled in the MIDI implementation. Um, so I'm going to click 74 and then automatically I see that data that I recorded from that encoder in the lane here. Nice. Uh, so if I'm if I have that lane open, I hit E. Uh, Luna will actually make that automation lane or the MIDI CC lane rather part of the zoomed in view, which is really handy. Nice. So yeah, now I have um, all this automation down here in the MIDI CC lane. Then I can edit just like any other automation. If I grab one of these uh, straight parts of the line, you'll see I have a little double arrow, and I can scale everything up and down together. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I just placed a breakpoint that I didn't want to place. So yeah, you can um, basically, that's like your trim mode, your offline trim mode, where you can uh, scale everything up and down together. I can also come in here and hold down control um, to draw in with the pencil key, which of course will draw based on the current grid value. So if I uh, turn so up since the you were in since you were in quarter notes snap, it snapped your, your CC data to that, right? Yeah, to quarter notes. So it's not very um, resolute. If I change it to 64th notes for example and now i can draw with much more resolution mm -hmm. um, and you can also turn off snap or hold down the command key so control command and that'll let you off road um, basically it won't snap to the grid oh nice so you don't even have to turn snap off to be able to get smooth automation just add command to it right yeah and that works for anything you know whether you're dragging clips around or notes um, if you just hold down command it'll turn off snap temporarily um, which is really handy if you want snap on for most things. Like for mm -hmm. example, I usually want snap turned on so that when I move clips, they're they're lined up with the grid. Yeah. Um, but when I'm drawing an automation, I usually don't want it. So I just usually just keep snap on and use that command trick to temporarily turn it off while I'm doing certain things. All right. I can't believe we didn't do that one in our hundred tips episode. That would have that seems like a really fundamental one, right? To like yeah. always remember command command just means being able to and it's not just slip around. I think what right if you have snap turned off. When you, it does the opposite, correct? When you, when exactly. you hold command and you're not in a, a snap mode, it starts snapping things again. So it's kind of just like it, a quick way to break out of wh whichever mode you are in. Yeah, exactly. If snaps off, um, I'm dragging around. It's not on the grid. I can hold down command and instantly snap. So yeah, depending on which way you like to normally work, you can kind of leave snap there and then use command to modify that. It's super handy. Yeah. Nice. Um, so, so yeah, that's you know, so drawing, much that's drawing, editing. And of course, with with MIDI CCs, right? You can copy and paste. Um, you know, and you can take. You can either copy and paste from one CC to another CC. You can duplicate. Say you just did an automation for like a bar, and you want to repeat it. You can just select that automation uh, and quickly duplicate it, etc. Yeah, and it's tied with the um, the actual clip as well. So if I were to duplicate the full clip, it'll duplicate that automation with the notes as well. So it's always kind of tied in there. Mm -hmm. uh, nice. Um, so that's recording, drawing, editing, lifting, lowering. That's anything else about CCs, uh, 
that you've seen people ask about or in the chat if you guys have got other cc questions uh let us know um yeah we've, we've talked about this before but one thing that um i think is cool that luna does that the way it implements it is pretty easy to use um, and I've seen a few people ask about it before, but you can do program changes with the CC land as well, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty handy. It basically, just would click to add a, a breakpoint, just like you would for any kind of other automation. And then it brings up this little box where you can actually select what bank and what patch um, you're loading for that program change. So that's a cool little hidden feature in there. Nice. Uh, question here from Tony is, how do you assign the Moog button to the CC? Um, so with the, with the mini Moog, all the CCs are fixed. Uh, exactly. so, so that table, that table at Matt, and it's super easy to find. Just Google uh, Luna Moog CC, and it'll bring you right to that page. Um, so they're they're fixed. So then, what what you're gonna want to do is you will have to look up for your controller, uh, being able to edit the edit the MIDI CCs on your MIDI controller, uh, which for most of them is as simple as uh, opening up like their little utility app, and or like the Roland one I have here. There's a way to get into the MIDI edit mode. Uh, where I can tell it exactly which one, you know, what I want C1 to be controlling. Yeah, that's the way mine works too. I just touch the, the knob I want to change, I hit the edit button, and then I can use the plus and minus keys to change the CC it's assigned to, then I hit enter again, and it's saved. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's super easy. To depend. Just look up the, the manual for your media control if you're not sure how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, all those CCs are fixed, so there's not a way to change, like, what 74 is mapped to in the Moog. 74 is always going to be that cutoff knob. Um, so you just got to change it on the controller side. Nice. Nono's asking, uh, can you select multiple tracks and edit them at the same time? So say, and I assume this is related to CC. So like if you had multiple, if you had multiple tracks of that Moog with CC data, would you be able to edit the CC across both of them at the same time? Yeah. If both uh, clips were selected, I mean, um, it, it, it works just like any kind of other selection grouping inside of Luna. Mm -hmm. If both those clips are selected and they both have information in that lane, then yeah, any kind of changes that I make to one will, will kind of be mirrored in the other. Uh, for example, if I added a breakpoint or, or move things up and down, like I was shown before. Nice. Rad. All right. Well, let me, uh, let's, let's keep on moving through here. And again, if you guys have got MIDI questions, drop them in the chat. We'll do our best to, to keep touching on them. Uh, but I wanted to jump over, continuing kind of on this like editing side of things, uh, because that's where I spend so much of my MIDI time. Uh, <laughs> next, uh, you know, want to talk about versions and MIDI merge, et cetera. Um, so I uh, have an example of that here in my session. So with this uh, mini Moog uh, bass track, uh, you know, this is one of those things, uh, half the fun of playing these instruments is being able to kind of come up with ideas, but you never know when you're going to actually play something that you like. So uh, I'm sure a bunch of you have, uh, have fallen victim to this in the past. Uh, if you're anything like me, if you came up with something really cool, but you just weren't recording, you were just like, oh, I'll just put an input monitor and not, no, 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 no. Guys, there's no, especially with MIDI data, like, you know, I give the I give a pass for audio data, right? Because you're like, oh, I'm eating up hard drive space for just gibberish that I don't need. Oh, okay, I don't agree, but sure. Uh, <laughs> with MIDI data, there this this you know we're talking about a, a few bytes, so there's really no good excuse to not go ahead and hit record and capture in the ideas. Um, because what I like to do is I, is I use versions, you know. So to open up the versions menu, we've, we've covered this a couple times, but at the tra top of the tracks bar, there's this button here that pulls out the versions. And then what you can do with that is you can create multiple versions of a track. So here's V1. This is probably, you know, this is me putzing around, uh, come, trying to come up with ideas, figuring out what I want to do for this, for this baseline. And then, you know, it was fine. There's probably some cool moments, you know, I'm figuring some stuff out for the bridge, but it wasn't quite it. So now rather than just, you know, recording on top of that or deleting it or undoing, really easy. Control backslash makes a new version. So uh, really easy, quick way to just, you know what? Don't throw that away. I I'm probably not going to use V1, but I want to try again. Control backslash. And you don't even have to have those versions menu open to do that. Once you guys are familiar enough with this process, a lot of times like when I'm in the, in the moment of creating, I just I just leave that hidden and, and keep on using backslash. So that way I, have, I can go back to these other versions, but I'm not locked into them. Um, so that's you know tip number one, and then from here it's it's essentially the same sort of workflow as comping audio, you know, which we've covered a couple of times on the show, uh, you know, being able to like comp vocals. Essentially, what you're going to do, the way I way the way that I do it is, and this is kudos to the to the Luna Dev team, man. I really like the fact that you are able to, you know, the bottom bottom part of the MIDI clip. See where it's solid red down here. 
this area allows me to quickly and easily make selections of the clip. So this is going to be the important distinction I want to really make sure you guys all understand is like when I'm using the bottom of this, I'm selecting the whole clip. So the notes, the CC data, everything about what's going on here is being selected. Uh, and then if I click the top, the top, uh, you know, kind of bar of this allows me to quickly move the whole clip. So I like that the top and the bottom, this is where you can move or you can select. And it's very similar to, you know, what you can do with, uh, with an audio clip where you can select it. You can click on the top bar to move the whole thing uh, as well. So it's, it's similar workflow here. So if I want to say I want to comp this together, I want to use this part of the verse. I would go down here, select it, hit Command C, or actually I think I can just press C, and then go to version three and hit V, just like that. I've now I've selected what I want for the verse, and then say for the second verse stuff here, again just select the part that I want, hit C. Go to the other playlist, hit V, so on and so forth. So this is a really easy, quick way to comp together, uh, you know, a, a take from multiple clips. So the important part, and the reason why I was making such a big deal out of using the bottom part here, is because this is bringing over my clips. Now, let's say, let's just say, I wanted to, I wanted to use, you know, kind of this part. You know, I wanted to keep these notes, but I also wanted to add these notes to it. I wanted to kind of copy and paste, I wanted to add together some notes. For that, I'm gonna go into the note area, and now now when I do this, I'm selecting notes. So I've, I'm not selecting clips anymore, I'm selecting notes inside of that. Now when I hit Command C, and I come to my comp, and I hit Command V, it's gonna add those notes to the other notes. So this, if you guys, if, if you're like me, sometimes you'll play the left hand part in, and then you play the right hand part in because you can't play two hands at once. Hands up, one hand up if you guys are like <laughs> me. Uh, this is such a great way to be able to bring those two together, say on like a piano track, where you can, you can you know, do a, a piece of it now, another piece of it later, comp it all together. Um, that's one way to do it. But of course, there's a slightly faster way to, to if you want it, that's essentially what a lot of people refer to as like MIDI merge. Uh, I'm merging together two takes of MIDI data. So that's the copy and paste after the fact way. But you know the way that's kind of faster and easier, if you will, is to up here in the toolbar. I'm going to go in. I'm going to go into my MIDI workflow area, and then on the left side of it here is the MIDI merge button. So when this is turned on, anything I do, whether it's adding more notes or adding MIDI CC data, it's going to be it's going to be adding to what I already have. Um, so this is a lot of times what I'll what I'll end up doing is actually, let me put this back on a good take is say something like this synth lead track here. Um, you know, so I played in the notes. I wasn't really worrying too much about like giving it some automation or some shape. But now what I want to do is I want I want to add just to to Matt's point, controller number 74, I want to add some brightness to this. I want to be able to kind of manipulate that um, that cutoff filter in real time. So what I can do, it's super easy. I can put drop this track into record. And now when I now when I hit record on my track, I'm going to be recording in just the MIDI CC data on top of the note data that I already have captured. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. There you go. So now, now you know, since I was in MIDI merge mode, I didn't lose any of my note data. And nothing got overwritten. I just got to add to it, kind of overdub uh, my cutoff controls here, which you can see. Those are those are some beautiful peaks. I gotta say, I must say so yeah. myself. Great sweeps. I, I couldn't you couldn't draw that stuff in, right? You gotta you gotta do that stuff by hand. Yeah, um, yeah and, and just in case it wasn't super obvious, um, MIDI CCs uh, are separate from automation. So the automation mode that you have the track in doesn't matter for recording CCs. You could have the automation mode set to off, and what Ben did will still work. Yeah, which I, I agree. This It can be kind of confusing, right? Because you're looking at CCs are controlling this cutoff frequency. But, of course, if I come in here, you know, so I'm on, on my synth track, view notes, uh, I can come over here to the instrument uh, parameters that are automatable, I can. There's also an automation for uh, for the filter cutoff, right? 
So in this one, this is not, you know, you can see my data was written to CCs and not to automation. This is kind of like a, a, you know, the plugin version of it is getting the automation data from the track, but the MIDI side of it is also driving the same knobs. So there's technically two ways that you can access the same knob in that sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's going to be confusing. I'm sorry. There's, there's no better way to, to really deal <laughs> with it. Uh, other yeah, than one's just, for performance and one is for like, uh, editing afterwards. That's the way I look at it. You know, if yeah. you want to use something for, for, for perform performance rather, um, it would be CCs. If you just want to edit it after the fact, then or draw something in after the fact to be automation. I think that's the easiest way to think about it. Yeah. That's, that's probably, that's, that's probably the best way to, to treat it. Um, so that's, that's editing automation, MIDI merging, uh, using versions. Uh, so now we, you know, I promise we're going to talk a little bit about nudge, uh, because as you guys know, uh, or hopefully as you guys know, uh, we just added in some new, uh, nudge functionality to Luna. So now audio MIDI doesn't, and it doesn't matter. You can nudge anything you want. Uh, and previously, if you guys, uh, I think what, since V1, Matt, we've had nudge for MIDI notes. So you can take right. a MIDI note, you can nudge it around, you can move it by a 16th. Um, you know, you can, you can move it by, a uh, by a value, but now you can nudge everything in your session. It's all unified. Um, so the nudge settings are up here in the same, same sort of workflow bar, you know, so, but instead of in, being in the MIDI workflow, I'm going to come over here to the edit workflow. Um, and now that I'm in the edit workflow, I've got the nudge controls available to me. Speaking personally, I I loved I, I basically always leave my nudge on time, and I'm either between five or ten milliseconds. Like to I just for so I've done this for so many years where like I leave my nudge on ten milliseconds because to me like I can nudge things forward on the beat, I can nudge them back on the beat, and with ten milliseconds you can you can kind of you can really feel it. You can really feel the impact that that's having on on the groove uh, or how something's kind of locked in with my part. Uh, so by putting this on ten milliseconds. Now what I can do is I can let me I'm gonna zoom in here on uh, on the beginning of the space track so you can really you can really see this. Let me make my grid a little. All right, so I'm now on a beat grid. Uh, so you can see this is all unquantized right now. You know, just a touch behind the beat. Now if I wanted to exaggerate that and I want to just move this entire clip, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna use that top selection bar right up here. That means I've now selected my whole clip. And if I hit the nudge, uh, the nudge, I would call this nudging backwards because it's laying it back behind the beat. I've gotten caught in, I don't know about you, Matt, but like what's backwards, what's forwards. Cause yeah. to, you know, if you're reading, if you're reading words, forwards is to the right, but in music, moving it behind the beat means also moving to the, it's, it's super confusing guys, but I'm going to talk yeah. in the musical terms of like how it relates to the beat. I'm going to move it back which is the period key. Um, so I just moved it one nudge back, 10 milliseconds back. Uh, I can do it again, nudge back. And, and to be clear, when you say back, you're talking about moving it to the right. right? Correct, yep, yeah. yeah. Let me <laughs> let me zoom in, zoom in so you guys can see it super, super clear. Let me make it super, super big, there we go. So I'm hitting it to the right, moving it back on the beat, right? I'm moving it further and further away from the downbeat, from where, from where in theory, it probably should be. Um, and then if I go, if I use the comma key, it's, it's comma and period are your two kind of your main, uh, two nudge keys. So comma is moving it backwards, forwards on the beat. <laughs> it's moving it to the <laughs> left. It is moving it forward in time. It's moving it. So I'm now ahead of the beat with my bass. Uh, so this is, you know, this is a, a great way to be able to just take a drum loop, lay it back, take a bass part, lay it back take a guitar part, push it forward. This is, to me, this is such a great way to be able to just make things kind of groove and, and, and kind of manipulate how they relate to the pocket of a, of a track. Uh, so period, period and comma are your two hotkeys there. Yeah. And the way you're doing it right now, it's moving the whole clip. So if you were to bump it back, your clip will no longer line up with the grid. There's actually a cool way um, where you can move stuff around within the clip without actually moving the boundaries of the clip itself. Oh yeah, what's so that you, one? If you hold down the control key mm -hmm. and then do a period and comma, that will just shift the MIDI notes around within the clip, but the actual clip boundaries will stay locked to the grid exactly where they are. Oh, that's uh, especially super cool. if you have another clip right before it or another clip right after it, where you don't want to move the whole clip and cover up parts of those other clips. Um, mm -hmm. That control period and comma that that's the way to do it. Yeah, so you guys can see the the edge of my clip 
that's no longer moving, but the notes inside of it are moving. And again, this applies to, to audio too, right? So if I yep. come up here to my audio clip, you know, it's, it's going right up to the bar line here, just how I'd want it. But if I added control and nudge, you can see that the, oops, there we go. I guess it's not working for this one. Is that because I have the whole clip on there, Matt? It should be the whole clip selected and then uh, you can move the audio around within it. Yeah, that's how it's working here. Yeah, it's not working on this session. Might be bugged, but uh, the so that's nudging the whole region, nudging the the things inside it, and then again, very important to me. Uh, every once, you know, a lot of times I'll I'll kind of like what I did, but then I'll be like, all right, well, dude, this clearly, clearly this is you're a little too behind the beat. So you can get in here. I can just select those two notes and nudge to this, just those notes back a little bit closer to where they were supposed to be. Um, so basically, you know, this is kind of, if you want to edit, if you want to preserve the, the performance exactly how it was, uh, you can use nudge to kind of just move things in and out. But of course, the next logical thing that you would want to do, if you're me, uh, on almost every track you play, is you're going to want to quantize it. Uh, of course, there's a, you know, quantizing there's a few really cool cool things that this does and a cool a few like just really important things for you guys to to know and remember when you're using quantize so to get to it hit the q button on a clip and then it brings up the quantize area over here in the focus pane um yeah if you like keyboard shortcuts that's a uh, shift command u shift command u like it uh so for your grid uh Cool. Yeah, you guys can see the notes and you can see this area. So I'm gonna, I'll keep it zoomed in over here so you can see this really easily. Uh, when you open it, but it doesn't do anything automatically yet. Even though I have auto apply turned on, since there's no settings for it, there's nothing to auto apply at the moment. Um, but as soon as I, as soon as I start adding a grid value to it, oh, also nothing's happening because I have nothing selected. <laughs> I hit the Q button, <laughs> but I don't have the clip. Select the clip. Tell it what you want this to work on. Because you could also, right, Matt, you could just select a few notes. You can quantize specific notes inside of a clip, or you can or you can quantize a whole clip. So it's important that you select what you want to have quantized. Yeah, it works on the current selection. So make your selection first, and then hit Q or Shift Command U. Yeah, and this is this is the sort of stuff that, like, as you guys can see, even I get caught up a little sometimes just being, oh wait, why is it not doing it? Oh, because I had nothing selected. Now with Auto Apply turned on. As I change my grid settings around, you guys can see down below, it's now quantizing everything to quarter notes, eighth notes. Now we're getting to sixteenths, which is probably for this sort of part about what I would want. Uh, but of course, we can make a thirty-second notes, and this, you know, this part just in general, it's got a lot of swing to it. So I would add swing, you know, and let me zoom in, zoom in down here so you guys can see what swing is doing. So swing is always, you know, it's kind of relationship between. Uh, 16th notes and and the upbeat right before them. Uh, so as I add more swing, you'll see my 16th notes kind of drifting back in time uh, to be a little bit more swung. But again, for me, a lot of times what I love to do is rather than going 100%, making this all 16th notes, exactly 16th notes, make sure you guys are you know listening when you're doing this. Don't just don't just blindly quantize uh, because man, sometimes like bringing the strength down to 50% or 75, like bringing this down preserves some of the little little things but kind of also kind of locks things in in a, in, a, in a really good way um so you know mess around with, with the strength and then now since auto apply is on what that means is it's, it's just doing it net with what i have selected if i turn that off uh if i turn auto apply off there we go uh nothing will happen to unless i hit quantize and then when i quantize now it's moved all my notes you, might, you probably saw them just shift around here let me undo that um so with auto apply turned off it doesn't do any quantization until you hit the quantize button it's basically it turns into an apply button whereas if i turn auto apply on it's now kind of doing that quantization it's showing me as i'm doing it um it, it's doing the quantization in real time uh so these those are kind of two really important things but know that auto apply doesn't mean that everything I record in this track is automatically quantized, right, Matt? Like, yeah, yeah, we don't have real time quantized like on the way in right now. Um, auto apply only applies to like when you're clicking those little buttons within that quantized panel. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and of course, you know, so now with nothing selected, nothing's going to be getting or 
it did it kind of applied the quantization right because i had these all selected and i was in here tweaking settings uh but one of the other things i really kind of love about luna is say i decide you know what man ben you, you didn't play that bass that badly we can we can leave it unquantized it's cool you can always come back and say you know what actually that's what you, as you guys saw i selected all those notes i still had the quantize area in my window open by going to off it's like cool no, no all good man we can we can go back to as you performed it um which I, I really love being able to get back to to those settings um i guess that matt that kind of works does that work all the time or are there some exceptions to how the using the off inside quantize like is there a way to apply quantization and not be able to get back to uh to without quantization yeah i think the main way you'd get into that is if you um consolidate so like say you had two midi clips that were you know split separately mm -hmm. um and then you quantized one of them and then you consolidated them as soon as you consolidate that quantization will get baked into the clip um, gotcha. so you won't be able to undo it at that point but as long as it's a single clip um, you can pretty much always get back to the original performance by hitting that off button just right. a super cool feature. I, I don't think I've seen that in any other DAW, and it's like I use that all the time. You mm -hmm. know, if I'll write like my drum line, and I'll add some swing to it, and then I'll go and record my bass line. I'll be like, maybe that's a little too much swing. You know, the bass doesn't sound quite right. I can go back to my my drum track and undo um, by hitting off, and then I can kind of dial in a different swing setting. So yeah, it's super handy. Yeah, and this is yet again another another great reason, guys, to be using versions. Uh, so you know, for this, what I would do is I would create a duplicate version, right? So I like V2, I like it unquantized, but I want to hear what it sounds like quantized. A great way to do this is to like make a new version. In this case, I duplicated the version. And then now on, on number four, this one, let's go, let's quantize the crap out of that. Like just hard 16th notes, no swing. So now I've got, you know, version four, which is perfectly all together on the beat. And I've got version two, which is the loose way that I played it. Um, because a lot of times, you know, the big thing for me is like, stuff like this right where i was clearly you know just trying to like do either like little hammer-ons or little like slides and notes or you know kind of playing two notes at once and neither one of them deserved to be on the grid you know here it's moving it into a 16th note pocket to line up with my drums but you know what i prefer this so i can come in here i can copy copy those notes paste them into version four delete and then delete the quantized ones that i don't want you know it, it kind of it would allow you to edit between a quantized and an unquantized version if you wanted to, wanted to rock that way, um, or of course I guess maybe the easier way would be to come into this one, select the notes that are wildly away from where they're supposed to be, and then since I have auto apply on, as soon as I change the grid here, you saw those notes. As soon as I made a change over in the quantized, that's where in the auto apply get started right it doesn't just yeah. do it the minute i open up that window it does it once i start doing something in that window and you can see it left all the other notes alone but these two that i had selected they're now locked into the grid um so this is a, a really cool way to you know again just kind of be all right down beats you know the stuff that's supposed to be hitting on the beat get on the beat uh and all you have to do is just kind of leave that open quantize those notes so there's it's one of those things that you got to do it to really get into the flow of how this all works. But once you do, um, you know, speaking personally, like uh, the MIDI editing inside Luna, to me, this is uh, just as fast and easy as any other DAW that I've edited MIDI in before. Yeah, definitely. I mean, once I've got comfortable with the MIDI editing Luna, now there's, you know, nothing that I couldn't edit in Luna MIDI wise that I could in other DAW. It's just a matter of kind of getting comfortable with a different workflow. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Uh, were there any questions around the stuff I was talking about there, Matt? Well, I wasn't really keeping an eye on chat. Um, Tricky made a good point that you can always command Z to get back out of your quantize, which is cool as long as you haven't done anything after you quantized. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's where that off key comes in handy. Cause say you quantize and you go and do a bunch of other stuff, edit some clips or whatever. Um, then your command Z isn't going to undo the quantize right away. It's going to do everything else you did after. So yeah, that's where uh, the off key comes in handy. Nice. But, yeah. I think everything else, uh, everybody's right. jabbing with. I see uh, Darren asked a while ago, uh, can we talk about fade-ins and fade-outs on MIDI? Um, so the, for doing fade-ins and fade-outs, since, you know, obviously on an audio region, right? You can just kind of, there we go, fade-out, e super easy. Uh, MIDI, these are all, it's all note data, right? So the way to, if you want to do a volume in and out, you're going to have to, you're gonna want to do that with volume automation. Um, yep. So, you know, what I would do is I would click here, you know, view, right now I'm viewing notes. I would instead want to view the volume. So now I'm looking at the volume automation and then, you know, draw a break, uh, break point there and see one 
pull a breakpoint down over here, and now I've got a fade in. Um, so now, you know, this is a great tip to, I want to make sure everybody knows. So like if this now locks in my fader, right? So I can, when I move my fader over here, it's going to snap. When, as soon as I press play, it's going to snap back because I've written volume automation into that data. So what I, what I kind of actually recommend to folks is rather than writing your note data, you know, if you, especially if you're in like a production mode, you don't necessarily want to lock in your volumes this early into the process. A great place to do this instead you got two. You, you got a lot of options, actually, guys. But the one I would probably go for, honestly, would be the volume of the plugin. So here I've scrolled all the way down my list. I'm now editing the mini Moog volume, so the master volume on my mini Moog. So now by adding that breakpoint and coming in here, so I'm now doing a volume automation. I'm doing a fade in with the volume knob inside the mini Moog, and I can still adjust the overall volume of the bass throughout the rest of the track using my track fader and a. Uh, so, you know, just know there's not only one place that you can do a volume automation. There's often like two, if not even maybe three different places that you could do something like that. Yeah. And for whatever reason, using like an instrument that doesn't have a, a very clear cut volume knob, you can always add something like a, a utility plugin or like even an LA two way and then automate the gate on that. And there's a mm -hmm. bunch of ways to do it. So, yeah, there's lots of ways to get to silence, thankfully. Yep. Right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, so that's MIDI editing and, uh, Christian's asking you if we can add curves to automation um, easily. So, uh, Matt, I guess there's you can kind of you can add extra points and kind of approximate a curve, but you can't get a beautiful like fading curve with automation data yet, right? Yeah, unless you're you know just holding down control to get the pencil key and drawing in the curve. Um, yeah, there's no way to like bend a straight line into a curve either way. Mm -hmm. but that's, that's a, a good that's feedback a, thing. I was like, yeah, that's a great thing, great idea for feedback right there. Um, nice. Uh, Christian says he's love love really like editing MIDI and Luna. He's used Live and Logic for years, and he actually prefers Luna. Uh, and the only thing that's missing is the curves and automation. So uh, yeah, definitely hit the feedback button. Let us know that. Uh, Latoya was asking, how do you bounce the click track in Luna? Uh, that's actually a really cool one, man. So here I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you that we've kind of highlighted this before, uh, but there's a really cool trick for quickly making a click track. So all I, what I did just now is I hit. Uh, Command Shift I uh, to create a new instrument track, and it, it's going to pull up Shape here by default. Um, and then, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Percussion. I'm going to go Cowbell, and you know what? I don't even need to. Uh, I don't even need to play this in live because what I can do is I can just create a clip that was uh, Option or Command Shift Three to create a clip inside my track. And then now all I got to do is find. Find one note. Keep on going up until I hit a cowbell. More oh, cowbell. Uh, more cowbell. There it is. <laughs> this one? Nope. It's a C. I had a no, I had a arm. Like that. I had a I had a MIDI I had a uh, a Moog track record armed with arm mode on. One second, please. Please hold. Please hold while doing the things. <laughs> and or and or forgets it's all right. Point of point of my story was using a shape track and a cowbell patch, programming quarter notes, you got a customizable click track right there, guys. Uh yeah. it can it can be easy unless you uh you've host up your own session with too much stuff going on in it. <laughs> Yeah, and Ben's way is definitely the best way, but say you just wanted to print the cl click track to an audio track, you can also just create an audio track, um, mute everything, set the input to that audio track to monitor left and right, and you can just print the, the click there as well. But definitely uh, using shape is the best way. You have complete control over the volume and the downbeats and everything. Nice. Killer, man. Uh, and so, Matt, I guess one of the other ones that we, we figured out that we haven't really talked about a ton that's included in, in Luna is ARP. It's, yeah, it's a MIDI a MIDI plugin. These are these are not very common, uh, but yeah, a MIDI plugin. What does what does it do exactly? Yeah, so like the name suggests, it's just an arpeggiator, um, but it's a very very full featured arpeggiator. I mean, it's um, after I spent a little bit of time getting to know it a better, it's probably the most full featured arpeggiator I have um, in, in terms of plugins and, and stock plugins from other DAWs. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's really killer. Um, I guess let's just uh, kind of go through it. Yeah. Try to center this in here. All right, so yeah, I've just got um, 
ARP loaded up in the MIDI effects slot of a track with MIDI Moog loaded. Um, so with MIDI effects plugins, which would be arpeggiators or um, chord generators or there's phrase players, lots of different versions of this, but you know, ARP is the one that uh, Luna comes with. There's this MIDI effects slot up here in the top of the instrument channel strip. Uh, let me just remove it. So if you click here, you'll get a list of all the installed uh, MIDI effects plugins on your uh, system, which are separate from regular MIDI instrument plugins. So be aware, you won't see your normal instruments here. Um, I'm going to click ARP. That'll load it on the track. And yeah, it's um, just out of the box. It's a standard arpeggiator going up like you were used to hearing on lots of synthesizers. Uh, but there's so much more to it. So uh, yeah, let's just start at the top and go through it. Sync uh, obviously just syncs it to the session BPM. Um, so if I take it out of sync, I have a separate tempo that I can set, tap tempo that I can uh, dial in a separate tempo from the session tempo. Most of my uses for it, I would always keep it in sync, so it's locked in with the grid. Um, then there's all these different arpeggio patterns. Uh, so basically, if I hold down three notes when it's in this up mode, it's just constantly starting from the lowest note and scaling up. Uh, if I do down, it's going to do the opposite, start from the highest note, scale down. Um, and there's all these different other versions as well, which I won't go through every single one of them, but um, really cool for adding kind of different variations to your patterns. A lot of mm -hmm. times I'll just kind of find a chord that I like. Uh, yeah, I'll throw a latch on. Then you can kind of cycle through them and find some cool stuff. Um, and all this is automatable as well, so you can um, you know lay out a big long chord clip in in uh, Luna, and then kind of cycle through these, print them to a new track, and get some cool variations that way. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but one really cool feature for recording that I find is this start grid right here. Uh, so this basically, if the transport in Luna is rolling, this determines when the ARP is going to kick in. Um, if it's on sixteenth note, the next sixteenth grid line that Luna crosses, it'll kick in there. Um, but I find it's really useful for making sure that my ARP starts right on a particular bar value. Mm -hmm. So for example, I'll set it to 1-1. One, one. Uh, no, let me zoom in here. So yeah, right now I'm kind of in between bars, um, but I want to make sure that instead of like just playing back the transport and making sure I hit it right at bar 38, um, this kind of helps me with that. So let's say I want to start right on bar 38. I have it set to 1-1. One, one. Um, if the transport's rolling, it won't start triggering the ARP until it hits the next bar value. So I can play at 37, for example. I'll start recording. I can start holding down some notes. Oop, I let go too soon. Sorry about that. And then right at 38, right on top of the bar, it'll actually start triggering the ARP. Um, and then, obviously, you can print that to a new track if you wanted to. But, yeah, it's a, a really good way to make sure that you don't have to, like, press all five keys or however many you're holding down right on the bar. You can yeah. press them before and make sure that it, once it hits the bar, it's going to trigger right on time and locked in. Uh, that's especially if you're the, using it. Yeah, if you, if you had that set to off, right, you could, in theory, you could be playing the ARP, but you could be, like, a millisecond ahead of the beat, and then the ARP is just kind of slightly out of sync the whole time. Yeah, so Exactly. So yeah, but I have you, to go in and edit the notes and, and make them line up. So yeah, it's exactly. a really cool like performance feature, especially if you're just like kind of jamming live. Um, it just makes sure that whatever you play is always on time, and you can use all these different subdivisions to make sure that you're starting uh, at the right time, depending on the the pattern of the song. Totally, I love that. And the uh, you know there's uh, the w there's presets in there. So what are the what are those four presets for inside of ARP? Yeah, so the presets um, down here, they just kind of uh, pull up depending on the current rate and other things you have selected. Um, mm -hmm. There's a quick way to get to different subdivisions that are around the same rate that you're set at right now. Oh, nice. Um, so yeah, there's one for, uh, this is basically triplets of 16th notes. I can go to 32 notes. And it's basically just changing the rate and the uh, subdivision down here. Mm -hmm. um, which you can also set manually just by clicking the rate field. You have all your your normal subdivisions that you'd expect, and then you can do dotted notes or triplets. So. Gotcha. So yeah, pretty much any kind of subdivision you, you'd be looking for, you can get with that. Nice. Um, and then you can kind of augment that with swing, um, which again just works off based on the current rate. So if I set the sixteenth note and I crank up the swing knob, it's going to start adding sixteenth swing. It's going to swing every sixteenth note. <laughs> Same thing if I were to change this. Yeah, 
swings every half note. So yeah, it just works based on the rate. Um, <clears throat> and then gate time, uh, that's kind of a basically just changes the gate. So if you have it set lower, the notes are going to be more staccato. The gate's only going to open for a short period of time. Um, what I think is cool is this goes past 100. It actually goes all the way up to like 200, um, which starts to kind of smear the notes together. Let me start it lower and I'll hold it and uh, crank it up. So you see, like when I crank it up past 100%, it starts like taking out some notes and making mm -hmm. some longer. So it's like another way just to generate different patterns than what you're actually holding down. Oh, totally. Which is pretty cool. And personally, I'm a huge fan of a really short gate, like good night, really percussive kind of short gate time. Um, it's a cool way to, to make stuff just super snappy, really. And then, you know, obviously add lots of delay to them because uh, you got short notes, get plenty more room for uh, for delay tails and stuff inside of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great way of turning pretty much any synth into like a little plucky ARP thing. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's addicting. Like you, you guys saw, Matt was just about to go off. He was about to start jamming for the for a half hour. <laughs> yep, <laughs> just on ARP. I love it. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the top half of the plugin. All that stuff's pretty self-explanatory. Um, the stuff down here at the bottom um, are some really cool like performance-oriented features. Mm -hmm. um, so octaves is, is just what it sounds like. That changes the number of octaves that's going to scale through for the notes that you're holding down. Um, so I'm just holding like a F minor chord. <laughs> if I do two, it's going to start at, start at the octave that I'm holding down, but scale up to a higher octave and then so on and so forth. If I hold down five, it's going to scale through all five octaves. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, it's another way to kind of uh, lengthen your art pattern without having to actually change, without actually having to hold down, you know, more keys than, than what you're holding down originally. Yeah. Um, latch mode is just what it sounds like. If you have it on, whatever um, keys you press down are gonna latch. Um, that kind of combines with these different latch modes here. So if I have it set to reset, um, as soon as I press something else, it's basically gonna replace the first uh, notes that I hold and replace them with the new hold notes that I'm holding. So. So yeah, it's a. If you're playing around with the song, you can just kind of hit the first chord of each chord change. It'll kind of um, latch from there. Um, transpose is really cool for laying down like a certain pattern and then being able to play it in different keys. Um, so for example, do the same thing. Now when I press a different key, it's going to keep the same notes, but just going to transpose them to whatever key I press. Yeah, it's another real cool um, way to kind of play along to a song um, without having to hold down a chord each time. You know, you lay down the chord the first time, and then you're just holding down single notes from there, and it transposes, which is awesome. Nice. Uh, then the other notes, or the other uh, latch modes, rather, um, note add, if I have, I can hold down a, um, a pattern, and then I can add pa uh, notes to that pattern, and I don't have to hold them down. Just as soon as I press them, it adds them to the ARP, and then I'll latch those as well. And then um, note or live add rather is the same thing, but it only adds the note that I hold to the pattern while I'm holding it. Uh, so, and then when I let it go, it goes back to the original art. And then the last one is just through, um, which will just latch whatever you play initially. Yeah, and the um, the Moog is monophonic, so it's not a, a good way to show this off, but it basically lets you latch a certain ARP, and then if you're using a multi-voice um, synth, you can play over it without it act also latching the other notes that you play on top of it. Um, so you can kind of get like a cool bed going, and then you can solo on top of it or whatever you're doing. Nice. That's, <coughs> dude, I had no idea about that these, la like, I've used latch on it, but I never messed with the different latch modes before, knowing that, like, oh, there's a way to, like, hold the the primary thing and then just you know kind of add a few notes to it here or there like punch them in um it's super super cool and of course you know as matt mentioned these are all automatable right so yeah um you know the first thing obviously a lot of you are like oh i want if if latch mode if i want to be able to you know, kind of turn it on and off and have it be a part of the performance uh so when you when you record enable the track you're gonna be recording all the midi data right but you're not necessarily gonna be recording the your how you're tweaking this plugin so but a quick way to, to get over that is actually put it into automation mode, right, Matt? So you, right now you're in automation read. If you were to put this into into latch, 
it's it's for your latch for your automation mode. It's right. now going to capture the changes that you make to this plugin in real time as you're playing as you're recording in your MIDI data. Um, so if you're going to be changing the pattern style, you're going to be changing the gate length. If you want to some of the stuff that Matt's showing you guys here, if you want to be able to tweak these in real time and have that be a part of your of the part that you're recording, just throw the automation mode into latch, and that's how you can capture all this automation data as it happens. Yeah, and I'll show you a quick demo of that real quick. So. Um. Yeah, I can change around the patterns, change the swing, change the gate, and then when I stop recording, come over here to my automation modes, everything that I just touched is now yellow, um, and it recorded all of those different moves that I made. Um, and I can come back in here and edit, just like what any other automation. So yeah, really cool to capture you know, what you're using ARP for in real time to capture that performance feel. Nice. Uh, and Matt, I've seen... More than one request for the tip. Uh, I know we kind of we we really briefly covered it in the hundred tips, and we've we've done it in depth once before. But if somebody wanted to capture and commit the ARP MIDI data, if say you wanted to you know perform through ARP, but you actually wanted the MIDI notes to go back in and edit later, do you right. mind walking people through the process of getting their IAC up and running and being able to send from this track through IAC and then capture it on another track so you can have the MIDI note data ready to go? Yeah, for sure. That's a cool little trick. Um, let me just turn off the start grid thing here. We're set to sixteenth. It's 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 helpful that you know one bar was extreme. That was a good yeah. example, but sixteenth or an eighth is probably all people really need, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm at least good enough to hit the eighth notes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe not the whole sixteenth note. But yeah. So um, the IAC driver setup. I guess let's let's go over that first. Um, so. Basically, there's a thing on your uh, system, if you're on a Mac, called the IAC driver. Um, it's built in by default. It's part of the OS, um, part of audio MIDI setup specifically. Uh, but you basically have to turn it on to be able to use it. Um, so what I'm doing here is just uh, open up audio MIDI setup. Uh, then I'm going to go to window up here and hit show MIDI studio. And this is going to show all the MIDI devices connected to my computer. Um, and IAC driver, uh, by default, this box that says devices online will be unchecked and will be grayed out just like that so you basically just double click on the IAC driver that brings up the window hit devices online that'll bring it online nice um, and, then... and you can actually set up multiple ports within the IAC driver uh, if you go to this ports tab here you'll see I have three different versions of this IAC driver set up um, which each new port that you add basically just creates another virtual driver um, so if you have multiple things you want to send, for example, I have one set up for sending MIDI from Luna to Ableton. I have one set up for sending MIDI from Luna to Machine. And I have one called Internal, which is uh, what I'll be using to print this around. <clears throat> so yeah, you can create new ports just by clicking the plus sign, um, giving it a name. Pretty self-explanatory there. Nice. Uh, but yeah, all you need to do is just make sure that you have at least one port enabled um, and the device is online. And then that'll make this driver available in Luna for you to use. Right. So yeah, once you set that up, you can close out of audio MIDI setup. You don't need that anymore. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I'm, let me start by just printing or just recording a quick little thing to this track. Cool. So yeah, I, I recorded it. When I play it back, I'm hearing the art because it has the art on it. But when I actually look at the MIDI notes here, they're just the notes that I hold down. That I'm not actually seeing the arpeggio here, so I can't really edit the arpeggio directly. Um, so the way I'm going to do that is take this out of record arm. I'm going to create a new instrument track. I'm going to set it to none. I'll just do MIDI print. So yeah, this is basically just a blank instrument track just for capturing MIDI. It doesn't have any instrument on it, so it's not going to produce any sound. Um, back on the original track, the, the source track, I'm going to set the MIDI output to the IAC driver. And again, all those uh, different ports that I set up show up here as separate drivers, so I can use them separately, but I'm going to use the internal one for this. And uh, my system's kind of bugged out right now with a bunch of MIDI editing. So, um, yeah, normally I'd be able to select this as the output, but you saw I got a little error in the top right corner there. Um, but, yeah, I won't be able to show this exactly. But, so yeah, basically just set the MIDI output of the source track to the IEC driver. Set the MIDI input on the capture track to the IEC driver, just like this. And then um, if I wasn't getting that error, I would basically be able to record arm this capture track. And then when I play it, it'll capture the um, the ARP notes. But I'm having a little bug here. So um, that's how you would do it on your system, aside from 
uh, not being able to set the MIDI output, everything else would be exactly the same. Nice. That was really cool. Because, yeah, last time uh, we talked about this, we kind of skipped over the IAC activation part, which is honestly kind of probably the most important part of the trick. It's like turning on IAC, and I love Matt's tip about kind of creating extra ports. So you have you have multiple available to you, and then you can label them to be for specific uses. Um, but, yeah, it's basically it's just a MIDI foldback that you're allowed to use inside of your machine, and then you'd be able to record, commit those ARP notes. Um, and I saw uh, in the chat uh, – uh, Kevin was asking about you know if you wanted to use this with external instruments. Um, so for for ARP and external instruments, it's super easy. Uh, so in this case, you know I've I just I powered up my Juno, put it, put it on a sound there, and so now my synth lead track uh, that I had going to you know it's going to a, a mini Moog on its track, but it's now also feeding that MIDI data out to my Juno, doing exactly what Matt just showed us. So come up here to MIDI output instead of none. I'm going to find the Juno in my list, send it out to my Juno. And so I'm going, uh, MIDI is going through an ARP on this track as well. Uh, and then it should be going out to that keyboard. And now I can, you know, capture in that synth lead happening here on the Juno. Let's, let's see what that sounds like. Sounds like a Juno. Sounds like a Juno, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's a that's a quick, easy way to, to get uh, you know get MIDI out to external instruments. Uh, it's as simple as assigning the MIDI out, and of course the ARP stuff. Uh, here I'm just committing it all into audio really fast like that. So uh, super fun and easy way to to take care of that, Kevin. Yeah, um, and uh, Rich was asking if he could use the IAC driver with a standalone uh, plugin. Definitely could. It, basically, mm -hmm. the same thing that we showed here. You just set the MIDI output to the IAC driver from within your DAW, within Luna, whatever you're using as the source, and then in your standalone VST, you would select the MIDI input as the IAC driver, and it lets you do the same thing. Nice. Uh, nice. All right, guys. Well, that I think that about does it for a bunch of the advanced uh, MIDI tips. We it was cool answering a lot of these questions as well. Um, oh, there was a slightly unrelated question I saw pop up in the chat here, Matt, was about you know kind of stacking together multiple Apollo racks. Um, you know, what's what's kind of what's the advice for folks if they do have multiple Apollos? Can you put them like side by side, or should you always leave a gap between them uh, for cooling? Yeah, best practice would definitely be to leave a gap between them. Um, that just makes sure that there's airflow on the top and the bottom gets to all those little holes that are in the, um, the, the chassis, which are there for airflow. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you're in a tight spot and you need to use them stacked on top of each other, in my experience, that won't necessarily hurt them, especially if you only use them for a couple of days. Um, but especially if you're in like a hot room if your studio doesn't have great AC or you're in Arizona or somewhere that's just really hot all the time, uh, yep. I would definitely leave a space between them because that'll <laughs> make sure that you get the, the most life out of them for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and as, as one of those people with, uh, who ran out of rack space and I wanted to leave a space, I really wanted to leave a space between my two, uh, my X eight and my X 16, I had to put them right next to each other. Uh, so the workaround I ended up doing, uh, is I bought two, uh, like 220 millimeter fans that I put at the back of them. Uh, and I believe for the, I set those up to kind of pull air through them since it's at the back. I set the, the fans so they would pull air from the front uh, through the little gaps and, and kind of around, you know, with, within my rack, there's way, air, ways for air to get in there. It pulls the cooler air in from the front, exhausts it out the back. Um, Cause yeah, at, at first my front, my face plates were untouchable. They were, yeah. they, they were getting so hot and this brought it down to like, I can now, I can leave my hand on there for, for minutes at a time if I needed yeah. to. That's a good tip. And if you have like a rack where the doors in the front and back are removable, if you do have to stack them on top, make sure you take the back uh, door off as well. Yep. And, uh, it's, I have one of those little laser thermometers. It was a great, great way to measure the before and after effectiveness of it. Like they were like, they were cooking, they were literally cooking. Like it was like 120, 140 degrees on the front. Um, yeah. and then now with the fans are under, it's under a hundred at all times. So like, it, nice. it's, it's really important for the life of your, of your gear like this. If it's running hot to make sure you're, you're able to get adequate cooling. Uh, so that way it doesn't, you're not frying the stuff inside. Yeah. And that's not just for Apollo. I mean, that's just electronics one one Make sure your stuff's not running too hot. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Prince is asking, yeah, if you, st what about stacking your twin on top of an octo? 
uh because those can those can both get kind of high but i think with the feet of the twin it kind of lets air through right yep that's why those rubber feet are there um there's holes in the bottom of the chassis so as long as it's got the rubber feet on them air will be able to get underneath and get through so yeah that, that's totally fine to stack them just make sure you don't take those rubber feet off uh brandon's asking which fans uh i don't i don't know the brand name i got but it was something on amazon where it was like two of them wired together and it came with a the important part for this was i wanted ones with uh metal grills on them that i could use to mount them because i just have like command strip hooks that they're kind of hooked onto at the top of the rack uh but most importantly they, they're able to they came with like a power adapter so i could run them off of an ac outlet uh, and not have to give them a uh, specific like a five volt because most most fans like that are built for going into a computer with like a, a molex or a sata connector yeah. um and so yeah these ones are specifically made for external use I think a lot of them, a lot of the ones, you, if you're looking around on Amazon, look for like the ones that are made for like PlayStations or video game consoles. That's where a lot of people end up buying those ones uh, that can be externally powered. Nice. Yes. And Van, <laughs> Van Dyke's, uh, Dan is saying, make sure you get super quiet ones. That was the other thing I looked for is I found ones that had a speed control on them. So I don't have to yeah. run them in full blast. I can, I think they're running on medium. And since they're down behind my desk, like I never hear them. They never bother me. Nice. Yeah, I see a few people mention they have uh, twins and rack mount units, and their twin gets way hotter in the rack mounts. Um, mm -hmm. That is expected. Kind of the, the design of the twin, like that that curved metal piece on the top, the faceplate is kind of meant to act as a um, heat sink and kind of draw heat away from the electronics. So totally normal. shouldn't get so hot that it's going to burn you, of course. But um, if your your twin is a little warm to the touch after using it all day, that's normal and not anything to worry about. Yep. Nice. All right, well, speaking of the heat, let me uh let me pop open capital chambers <laughs> <laughs> even though even though drew's not here to do, do the deep dive i'm gonna do my best to uh to do the drew style deep dive for you guys um i've actually i've done a i did a five minute tip vi uh video about the capital chambers already uh where we we highlighted the song that we used in the trailer by jamie liddell uh and, and i think i talked about a, a bunch of these topics but if you haven't if you've missed that one or you just want a, a refresher or if this is new to you man uh, uh, capital chamber like the the UAD half yearly sale is still going, so you still have time to get a good deal on this plugin because holy crap, man, this thing, it, it's it's kind of magical what it does to sounds. It, uh, it's hard to it's it's not hard to describe. It's beautiful on um, anything yeah. you anything you put on. It kind of it fills the space and it, it just it creates this beautiful cloud around whatever it is you're working on, whether it's drums, a vocal, guitars. Um, and, you know if you guys if you aren't familiar. Capital Studios down in LA, historic, amazing studio. Uh, it's been around for ages. What the Capital Chambers are is they're, they're literally their rooms down below the parking lot. They're they they built these before they built the building, or and I think they did a few of them afterwards. So they actually had to dig up some stuff to to make these. But essentially, what they're doing, what they are, is they're very very reflective rooms. They uh, when I, I got to hang out with uh, the late Al Schmidt. Uh, when we were creating the trailer for this, and, and I get to I get to interview Al for an hour, asking, learning about these chambers from from the man who arguably knows them the best. And he remembers, he told me like he remembered going down there and shellacking the walls. So oh, the room, the, the walls are covered in in varnish, and they're just super shiny, super reflective, um, and disgust. It, it smells terrible down there. Like this is this is something that they, they basically set and forget. So there's a pair of speakers and a pair of microphones in these rooms. And what you would do is, you know, the at Capital Studios, there's a big kind of a telephone switch bay. So any of the control rooms can send to any of the chambers. You just have to book which room is getting which chamber for what part of the day. Um, and so what you would do is you would send from your console. You'd have a send set up on your console that could send sound out through the building, down into the dungeon, through a pair of speakers in the in the chamber, and then a pair of microphones would pick that signal back up, and then that that would get routed back into your console, and that would be your return. So you could send out dry signal, receive really wet, lush, amazing reverb back uh, on a return fader. Um, so it's kind of a crazy system. <laughs> they actually uh, you know came up with chambers and, and were able to do them, but it's a physical space and. As you guys probably know, you know uh, when we did the Ocean Way room models, a lot of that same technology and process went into creating the capital chambers. So that this isn't like a static IR. This is what a big thing I want you guys all to to make sure you're taking away from this is this, this isn't just like loading an IR file and then here's your here's your reverb. 
it's it's a component of it, but there's this dynamic room modeling that's also going on in here. So what that allows you to do is it allows you to do things like move the microphones closer to the speakers, which is such a cool way to, to take a you know a really really big sound and kind of add a little bit more presence to it. You pull it closer to the source of the sound, um, and this is all happening dynamically in real time. Uh, I mean, you know, kind of real time. Um, <laughs> So let me go through the controls here now that I've kind of explained what these rooms are and really what you're going to be doing here is sending audio through speakers, capturing it through microphones. It's about as simple as I can put it. So for the controls, you'll see at the top you've got two, four, six, and seven. Uh, and it's really helpful because it's pretty obvious what these, what these controls are doing. These are changing around which chamber you're, you're working with. Each one of these rooms is slightly different geometry slightly different amounts of shellac on the walls, like it's different speakers. So there, there's a lot of little nuanced variations between each one of these rooms. And this is the thing that's gonna have the largest impact on how your reverb sounds, because each one of these rooms sound different. They all have a different character and tone to them. And I'll, I'll play you guys some examples here in a, in a second. We can kind of go through each room so you can hear it for yourself what each one's doing. But essentially you pick the room, and then you pick your microphone. So you know, you've got kind of like a small diaphragm uh, condenser, 21D. You've got a, a big AEA ribbon style mic, another small diaphragm SM80 microphone, which if I remember correctly, these are actually the ones that are in the chambers uh, at the moment. And you've got a Sony uh, C37A microphone, kind of like a small diaphragm condenser, but in a slightly larger body. So pick your room. Pick your microphone. You know, the room has a big influence. The microphones also have a bit of an influence in the overall the the tone and the color that you're getting back. You have your minimum maximum for how close those microphones are to the speakers. And then we keep on stepping down here. Pre-delay. So this this adds a little bit of time between when the sound is received by the plugin and when it goes out through the speaker. So this allows you to add to me, pre-delay just kind of adds some distinction between your sound and its reverb. You can kind of put a little bit of distance between the two, um, and it, it just kind of it makes the reverb more distinct or more blended with the sound. Um, it's kind of the easiest way to think about pre-delay. Yeah, it kind of gets it out of the way. Your transients um, keeps things from smearing and muddying things up. Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, the decay knob. This this does not exist in the real world. So this the the thing with the chamber is it. Actually, almost all these things I've shown you so far, you can't really do in, in the real capital chambers unless you've uh, unless you were Al Schmidt. I think Al might, might be one of the only people that would uh, could really, and he often didn't need to do this, but changing out the microphones or moving them around the room, they it's this this is a very set and forget thing in the real world. It's chamber seven is chamber seven. It's just how it is. The mic, the everything is kind of set and forget. Um, unless you unless you're you're royalty and you're allowed to uh have the mics switched out or changed um but the other thing you couldn't do is you couldn't you can't change the decay of these rooms like the rooms are the rooms in the plugin you can you can go from the max the the actual time which is the max this is you know how the rooms actually are if you want a slightly shorter uh decay time to your reverb the plugin allows you to pull that down and kind of tighten up the sound of the reverb uh with the decay knob um and then we get into the filter section so this allows you to high pass filter your sounds. And this is, by the way, this is on the return. This is not on the send. This is after the sound has been captured by the microphones. It now goes through the filters. Um, so you can, you can take out some of the bass uh, frequencies or even it goes all the way up to 750. So you can even take out some of the mid content from the return and just focus on the highs. Uh, you got a bass control at 125, a mid control at 500, and a treble at 5K. Uh, I, when I was, I remember when I was preparing the five minute tip for this one, just how kind of really well tuned these three bands are for like, yeah. oh, I want more thump and thickness. Great. Grab the bass knob and crank it up. Oh, I want like the snare drum, like the, the meat of my snare and my guitars to have a little bit more going on there. Great. Grab the mid, pull it up. Uh, or vice versa. Oh, it's too thick. Great. Grab the bass, pull it down. Maybe pull yeah. down some mids and then boost the treble. Like, I can't. I I think I've left way too many mixes where I didn't EQ my reverb returns, uh, and now that I do it on uh, almost every time I pull up a reverb, like getting the tone, getting the length, getting all these settings dialed in is is great. But then even just a little bit of a lift or a little bit of a tuck with the return EQ 
makes such a massive impact to how it blends with the rest of the mix. Yeah, I wish every uh, reverb had a built-in EQ like this because I always end up loading one after anyway just to clean things up, but it's right? a cool feature. Yeah. Uh, and then you get down to the bottom, and this is kind of this is your mix control. Uh, so by default, Chambers pulls up with the wet solo turned on. That means you're not getting any dry signal. Uh, it's assuming you're kind of using this as a send return, but if you are using this as an insert, you can turn wet solo off and then control how much uh, reverb is in the mix. Uh, and yet again, I love that the way that you notice, you're like, dude, the 50% looks a lot like 15%. Why is that? Well, because with reverb, you know, most of the time you're kind of dialing some, you want like a little bit of it, right? If you're going to use this on an insert, 50% reverb is way too wet for yeah. almost most uses. So I love that they tapered the knob so that way you get really fine control between zero and 15. Like the, this is kind of the, where the sweet spot's going to be if you're using this as an insert. And of course, you can still crank it all the way to 100 or between 15 and 100, but you're going to find yourself kind of tweaking in between here if you're using it as an insert. Uh, and then the width, this allows you to control how stereo is the return. Um, so you can go all the way from 100%, which is full stereo, or you can kind of bring it, start mon making it a little bit more mono, a little bit more focused to the stereo feel from the chamber uh, with the width control. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the overall, that's the GUI. Let me kind of reset some stuff here and then I want to, I want to play around with the chambers with you guys. And if you guys, let me know if you have any questions, uh, questions about the plugin as well. I want to make sure you guys are, are getting excited and, and trying this one out. So I got people asking about why the, um, the logo blinks while you're changing settings. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not like a full IR plugin, but there are like kind of multiple layers of IRs that get loaded in the background, depending on the mic choice and the room choice. Um, so yeah, every time you change the room or the mic, you'll see that blinking. It's just loading the, um, pseudo IR in the background. Um, and then once it stops blinking, it's fully loaded. So nice. <clears throat> same thing as like the BX 20, if you've seen that in that plugin as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, cool. So I'm going to, I threw, I've got a drum loop kind of thrown through there. Uh, I think I said the same thing on the five minute tip video, but drum loops are a really great way to learn a reverb because there's low end information, there's high end information, there's lots of transients to really excite the room. Uh, oh, yeah. So it makes it makes it a really good way to to hear what it's doing. But then I'll also I'll show you guys what it does in an entire mix uh, scenario as well. Uh, but for being able to learn the rooms, guys, really pay attention to the kick and the snare. The Reverb return, the tone of those returns. As I switch from room to room, it's almost like each one's tuned slightly differently. Like that's they all resonate in a different way and they complement the drums in a different a different area depending on which room I'm in. So let me show you what that sounds like. Let's turn that up. Let's exaggerate this so you guys can really tell. There we go. So this is number two. Okay, that one, number four, is a little bit more muted. Yeah. Oh, if you guys are here on the headphones, number six, there's like a mid-range stereo thing that just happened that I didn't have in four. We'll yeah, you can really hear it on the snare. Really on the snare, right? That's what, and then here's seven. Seven, there's a little bit more on the, like the that shiny thing on the right side. That kind of comes out. Yeah, a little more top end. So. Mm -hmm. Oh well, dude, six is six is doing it for me today. Yeah. What's so great about it is like any of these are usable. They're just like all usable in a slightly different way. Yeah, it, it's insane, right? Like they're they're all slightly different, but they're all different shades of great. Uh, yeah, it should exactly. be interesting. It'd be interesting. Uh, anyone that's, uh, if you guys are familiar with the capital, I'd love to hear what chambers you guys tend to gravitate towards. Um, it, I think by default pulls up in four. That was uh, that was Al's room. That was that was the one that he always had access to uh, whenever he was working. It was his favorite for vocals. Um, but yeah, right now for this drum thing, I'm, I'm really feeling six. Um, oh, I see. Uh, Prince is asking what what does width do? I can't get it to do it. So width should be the stereo width. Uh, let me play. Let me, so this is a stereo example, and if you're not getting anything out of it, make sure you're on a you have it on a stereo track. If you put this on a mono return or a mono track, the width control is not going to do anything for you. But remember, on six, like we had that that kind of stereo thing happen, especially on the left side. I was hearing it. Watch as I pull the width knob down. It's going to just mono up that reverb down the center. There we 
there's fully mono. So it, and that's back to stereo. So hopefully, hopefully you heard that difference when I went, especially going from zero back up to 100. You're like, oh, there it is. Um, so there's definitely a lot of scenarios where you may not want all that weight, all that reverb kind of happening on the sides of your mix. Um, if it'll, yeah, I'm seeing four and six. Four is great for both. Yep, four and seven right now. Four is, yeah, you know, a lot of a lot of fans of four, and you guys are not wrong. It's, it is a fantastic room. That's why um, they made it the default. <laughs> that's why they made it the default exactly. Uh, but yeah, let me show you. So I've got the filter. Oh, I had the filter kind of still engaged there. Let me let me play around with these EQ controls because again, I love what these are able to do to the to the sound. Open the filter back up. Now I'm getting more of the kick coming back through there. Let me exaggerate that. That 125 is just so much thickness. Pull it out. Just this bright shiny room, right? It's like. Yeah, I think, it really you know, has a body and heft to it. It really does. Here's some of the mids. The top, the nose of the kick and the snare drum just get exaggerated. Again, if I pull that out, it kind of tames it up in a cool, it kind of controls it in, a, in an interesting way. Yeah. Now more treble. Now the hi-hat stuff's getting exaggerated, like... You know, if I was adding reverb to this one drum loop, I'd probably end up something like... Now with that filter here, the difference that made, going from off, letting the low end content through to just like, you know, halfway up. Oh yeah, it adds up that kick. Great. It adds so much focus to the kick, right? And of course here, let me play with the decay knob. So I'm at full decay, you know, as the room normally is. Now if I pull that back, A yeah, you get the ocean room. way territory where it's not like really a reverb, it's just more of a room sound. Uh huh, dude. I I do guys. I do this trick all the time. Like, I'll pull I'll pull up Capitol Chambers. I'll be like, man, that sounds beautiful, but man, it's a little too big or a little too sticky of a sound. Decay control, guys. Like, just pull this back. Like, pull it, tighten it up, bring it into where you want it. And then a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll since I've now I've created a very short tail to this reverb. Now, adding a little bit of pre-delay will actually bring it back out, kind of displace it from where my drums are, so I get a short but a little bit of distance. So check out, the pre-delay is just going to, it's going to feel like I'm pushing this room backwards in the mix. So it makes it obvious again, right? Like, it goes from like, oh, this thing that's joined up with the drums to now like, I hear the room and I hear the drums and they're not they're not necessarily stepping on each other's toes. And pull that back. Now it's all one sound again. Yeah. Uh, so it, you know, a little bit of that just makes it for such a distinct room. Uh, and then of course, yeah, let me let me just quickly go through the different mics because again, you're going to hear a character difference and it's similar it's not dissimilar to what you're doing with the EQ down here, but these are, you know, it's not just as simple as an EQ curve for these mics because it's different sensitivities, uh, and all of these were measured in the room. So that that's the cool thing is like they they literally know what the effect of switching to a ribbon microphone has in capturing the reverb from that chamber. Uh, so yeah, I'll just step through these microphones so you guys can hear that real quick. I'm gonna open the K back up so we get the full full effect. Here's the Sony's. Twenty one D. So to me, like I, I hear the biggest difference whenever I go to the ribbon, kind of the smoothness that gives to to the top end of it. Whereas like the SM eighty or the twenty one D kind of have a little bit more precision. If that's a, that's making sense to you guys like it sounds like i'm just capturing i'm hearing more precisely what's going on inside the room when i'm using that one um so that is that's capital chambers guys that's you know too long you know want to walk away with how to use this one and you're not familiar with it select a room that that feels good with your mix select a microphone that feels like it complements it don't be afraid to move the microphones closer or further oh wait i guess i didn't play any examples of this let me 
Hold up, we're not done yet. We're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna hear what it sounds like to bring the mics closer to the speakers because this is another this and the decay troll. These two similar but different uh, effects. The decay, as you heard, tightened the you know just kind of dampened the room. It kind of brought it down. Whereas this is going to add some presence. It's going to add some immediacy. You're going to start hearing the dry. Almost it sounds like the the wet dry, but still kind of it's still bouncing around the room completely. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Hear that? So now we're going for, oh, for the what we know to like. The room's still there, but you're now you're now getting you're getting a little bit of the drums back earlier, um, since the the mics are now so much closer to the speakers. It's it's a really cool effect being able to control the you know this in combination with the decay control uh, are two of the things I I feel like I spend the most time tweaking when I'm working in here. Yeah, yeah, the distance is killer. It's almost like a combination of decay and mix control, where it's. Mm -hmm. It's like lessening or makes the decay sound further away, but not necessarily making it shorter or longer. Totally cool. Uh, And shout out to Danielle. (laughs) She's playing the role of me today, which is, hey, by the way, don't forget the plugin presets in here, guys, are insane. Uh, There's one for Al Schmidt. Rest in peace. The one. This is chamber four with the SM80s flat like it's just actually it is it is the default setting for capital chambers is al's setting uh but you got chris dugan damian taylor daryl thorpe frank filippetti jamie liddell chicarelli Joey warnaker john paterno mark needham nick abolas uh ross steve genowick who is also who, anyone that's familiar with uh capital they know know about steve tom Allen, like holy crap that's a lineup of incredible names who have all contributed presets so yeah if you if you're looking for a place to start steve genowick's drum room one big cross like all of these are such great sounding presets and you can see they they really oh good look at this steve's is uh he's on chamber two there instead of six but he had the kind of same EQ curve that I had uh, going there, yeah. Um, but yeah, guys. So this in the in the context of a mix, though, I just wanted to play this this last thing before we go. Let me pull it back to where I had it, kinda about here. Yep. Uh, so now you know I've got a couple. Of, I've got the drums. Let me pull those back down to a more reasonable level. Uh, but you know, also adding this to like my sample, a, a piano, a little bit to the arpeggiator, just kind of sprinkling it across multiple tracks. Listen to the before and after with the whole mix. Just add, man, it adds like this, just it adds size, it adds weight, it adds the, it kind of colors in between the lines exactly how you need it to. Um, uh, yeah, I can never get enough of this plugin. Capital Chambers, yeah. man. What a, what it's a cool like every one. time we show it off, now I just want to go play with it. But yeah, if you <laughs> haven't messed with it, do yourself a favor. Go start that demo. Play around with some of those presets. I mean, you won't be disappointed. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, any other Capital Chambers questions that I missed while we were geeking out? Moving the mics. Um, <laughs> Victor, Victor's noticing that yeah, when you move the mics, the doors open. That's the that's the invisible assistant gnome that goes into the room and moves the mics. Uh, <laughs> I love. I'm glad you caught that little Easter egg. Yeah. Nice. Um, cool. Well, guys, I think yeah, exactly. Best Coast is saying you know he likes to re audition the mics after finding a room, and the same goes for the space slider. Exact. Like it, you're nailing it, man. Find the room. Find the room that is feeling good for the tune you know for the for the key of the song that you're in for the the vibe that you're going for and then tweak the decay tweak the the mic position uh just get in there and kind of it's a fun one to to really learn and understand what each of those options afford you and different sounds that they have possible um that's a fantastic fantastic plugin so yeah highly highly recommend you guys check that one out if you haven't already and uh guys i think with that We've successfully we've office hour just just the two of us, Matt. Good job, man. Yeah, held it, we're held, holding down the fort. <laughs> Didn't think we'd go this long. We're almost at two hours again. Heyo. Seems like we can't do a show that's shorter than this. <laughs> I know. We we thought we thought today would be like oh we'll we'll race through all the media stuff, but no, there's 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 plenty plenty to talk about here. Yeah. Um, Good questions from the chat. Thanks everybody. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody at home, for tuning in. And uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, I think we're going to tackle the thing we have on our docket here to tackle next week is acoustic drum editing. Uh, so if you're doing multi track drums, we're going to talk about tracking them, grouping them, comping them, editing, nudging, all the sort of uh, stuff that you'd want to do around acoustic drums. Uh, so definitely tune in next week for that. Don't forget, if you got music to share with us, we'd love to hear it and feature it in our countdown. Hit us up live at uaudio.com. Uh, hashtag Universal Audio on your photos to show up in the countdown. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications so your phone buzzes every Monday when we go live or or whenever we post videos. And uh, oh, don't forget half a yearly sale on right now. Save up to like sixty percent on UAD plugins. Killer deals going on there. And the desktop platinum vocal promo. If you buy a Twin or uh, or Apollo Solo. And get a bunch of free plugins along with those interfaces. So definitely don't miss out on the good deals that are going on right now. And uh, with that, guys, thank you so much for hanging out with us again. And uh, we'll see you guys back here next week. Have a great week, guys. See you guys. Peace. <laughs>